Now I invite you to sit so that your feet are touching the floor, if you can, and so you can straighten your spine. Close your eyes or soften your gaze. Take a deep breath in. Exhale and let your shoulders relax. Take another deep inhalation, a long, slow exhale, softening any part of your body that may be holding tension. We all have many seeds within us, seeds of love, compassion, and gratitude, as well as seeds of anger, fear, and hate. Part of the practice of living is watering and nourishing the seeds we want to flourish within us and in the world. So choose a seed inside of you that you want to nourish and grow. Love, peace, compassion, whatever is calling to you. Imagine that seed beginning to sprout, sending the tenderest shoot out. Now imagine it growing, unfurling, and climbing up your spine. Feel how you can be rooted right here where you are, in compassion or love or whatever aspect you chose. And feel your roots mingling with the roots of the trees and plants all around us. Feel how all of us are reaching our roots out to each other. How we each can be blossoms and fruits of love and compassion, understanding and joy and more. Breathe into what it means to be interconnected and interdependent with every being on this planet. Then let it go with trust and gratitude. We continue our meditation in silence and the music that follows. In the spirit of Earth Day and a movement that Silent Spring helped spark that I hope will carry forward as we fight climate change, today's reading comes from the very first instance that Silent Spring ever appeared, which was in the New Yorker in 1968, let's say. This is not all of it, I promise. There was once a heart, a town in the heart of America where all life seemed to be in harmony with its surroundings. The town lay in the midst of a checkerboard of prosperous farms with fields of grain and hillsides of orchards where white clouds of bloom drifted up above the green land. In autumn, oak and maple and birch set up a blaze of color that flamed and flickered across a backdrop of pines. Then foxes barked in the hills and deer crossed the fields, half hidden in the mists of the morning. Along the roads, laurel, vibranum, and alder, great ferns and wildflowers delighted the traveler's eye through much of the year. Even in winter, the roadsides were places of beauty, where countless birds came to feed on the berries and on the seed heads of the dried weeds rising above the snow. The countryside was, in fact, famous for the abundance and variety of its bird life. And when the flood of migrants was pouring through in spring and fall, people came from great distances to observe them. Other people came to fish streams, which flowed clear and cold out of the hills and contained shady pools where trout lay. 
So it had been from the days many years ago when the settlers first raised their houses, sank their wells, and built their barns. Then one spring, a strange blight crept over the area, and everything began to change. Some evil spell had settled on the community. Mysterious maladies swept the flocks of chickens, and the cattle and sheep sickened and died. Everywhere was the shadow of death. The farmers told of much illness among their families. In the town, the doctors were becoming more and more puzzled by new kinds of sickness that had appeared among their patients. There had been several sudden and unexplained deaths, not only among the adults, but also among the children, who would be stricken while they were at play and would die within a few hours. And there was a strange stillness. The birds, for example, where had they gone? Many people, baffled and disturbed, spoke of them. The feeding stations in the backyards were deserted. The few birds to be seen anywhere were moribund. They trembled violently and could not fly. It was a spring without voices. And the morning, which had once throbbed with the dawn chorus of robins, catbirds, doves, jays, and wrens, and scores of other bird voices, there was now no sound. Only silence lay over the fields and woods and marshes. On the, on the farms, the hens brooded, but no chicks hatched. The farmers complained that they were unable to raise any pigs. The litters were small, and the young survived only a few days. The apple trees were coming into bloom, but no bees droned among the blossoms, so there was no pollination, no fruit. The roadsides were lined with brown and withered veget vegetation and were silent too, deserted by all living th things. Even the streams were lifeless. Anglers no longer visited them, for all the fish had died. In the gutters, under the eaves, and between the shingles of the roofs, a few patches of white, granular powder could be seen. Some weeks earlier, this powder had been dropped like snow upon the roofs and the lawns and the fields and the streams. No witchcraft, no enemy action had snuffed out life in the stricken world. The people had done it to themselves. Our platform speaker today is Senior Leader Casey Slack. the coal mine as a young person my great-grandfather died of pneumonia at 29 pneumonia there was a stream near the road on the way into the holler where my family was from that from the stories my mom and her siblings told was crystal clear and beautiful when they were children. They showed it to me and I said, ew, what? Because by the time I saw it in the 90s, the shift even from the dangerous and extractive coal mining that my grandfather and great-grandfather had been party to, to strip mining had caused the runoff in that mountain range, in that particular holler, to create a truly toxic stream. Where the village had gotten their water literally to drink and bathe in when my grandfather was a child, where my mom and her siblings had played as children, we weren't allowed to go near. 
Imagine when I learned that the river in Ohio had caught on fire. And then when it did it again, I don't really eat fish. This is often confusing to people, right? I am a person who lives on the coasts of the country. I eat fish in the Bay and in Los Angeles and here, but hmm, I don't really eat fish in the part of Ohio that I'm from or the part of West Virginia that my people are from because that might not be a good idea. I feel like I've never not known about climate change, about the disaster we are creating for ourselves and all the other living things on this planet. When I spoke last month about lawns and my distaste therefore, I talked about having avoided talking about climate change for a lot of my professional career because it is hard to talk about, because it is scary. I try really hard when I'm speaking to uh, give them hope, not hell. I feel like we get enough hell everywhere else. And I'd like to be able to give you answers that make it possible to address the world as we find it. And I don't know that I have answers the whole way. But I want to start with a feeling. And I want to start with a feeling that is hmm, not a fun one. I want to start with fear. Because it's scary. The reality of climate change, the reality of pollution and what we have done to our planet, what we continue to choose to do to our planet is scary. Deep in my bones, in my gut, scary. And like Greta Thunberg said in our opening words, we don't have the time to paper over the fear with a belief that it's gonna be fine. Now, I don't necessarily define hope, how Greta defined hope in there, and we're gonna get to that. But I wanna start with that we have to let ourselves feel the fear. We have to let ourselves be scared, even if just for a minute. Because fear has kind of two big things you can do in response. You can shut down. If you don't want to feel your fear, you can stop. But stopping might mean that you can't get forward motion towards doing anything about what you're afraid of. Or you can ignore it. And if you ignore it, well, you're also not going to do anything about it. Ignoring it can make you complacent. And shutting down on it can make you frozen. So I want to ask you to take a second, and if you want to talk to someone nearby about what comes up for you when you think about climate change, that would be great. If you want to just reflect with yourself for a moment, that's OK, too. I'll give you two to three minutes, and I'll ring the bell when I need you to come back. It's about the easiest I've ever gotten y'all back from a conversation. So one of the things that I find, and a lot of people find, is that just sharing that you're scared relieves that fear a little bit. 
Because one of the things that happens when we share our feelings, when we talk about what's going on for us is we feel less alone. You hear a little bit of your experience in someone else's. You feel seen in a place that might feel isolating. Fear feels really, really isolating for me. And when I'm afraid, I tend to want to back off of most people, cling to something I really understand. But if you can share, you can make a movement towards each other. And a movement towards each other is a movement towards relationship and next thing you know, you're developing your relationship not just with other people but with the planet. You're connecting with the earth through your connections with other people. You're going for a walk. You're thinking about how beautiful the trees are at this time of year. Did y'all see how beautiful it was yesterday? Yeah. You get to have those moments of, oh my gosh, what a place to be. What a planet to get to be on, not only in that it is amazing that it exists and supports life at all, but that it is beautiful, and each of its little parts exist in relationship with the whole. So I get scared, and I try to share that I have feelings. And then I try to think about what the next relational step is. What can I do in my relationships with the people around me, in my relationships with the earth, that is going to develop all of us in a direction that is more connected? You can kind of think of this as at relational levels. There is stuff you can do with yourself, right? You can practice some sort of meditative practice or walking practice or whatever it is that works for you to feel connected to the earth. When I was in my chaplaincy residency, there was a particular tree that I would go to. I would walk around having these very intense conversations with people, getting all of this stress piled on me. And I would go outside and I would find my tree, I would put my hand on the tree, and I would just spend some time thinking about what that tree had seen in the course of its life, about how many people had come there and had a moment with that tree, which was outside of the chapel at the hospital I worked at. On my days off, I would drive myself to the ocean, or when they had the line running, catch the public transit line out to the ocean. It's a long train, but it's worth it if you're in Los Angeles. And I would sit there, and sometimes I would say to the ocean, could you tell me something? And the ocean doesn't usually speak in language, but it does speak, because every now and then, something would happen, like I would be on the beach by myself, and I would say, hey, the ocean, I don't have any idea what's going on in, in my life, but you've, you've seen some things. You really know what's going on. Could you tell me something? And then there would be a seal, just me, a beach, and one seal. I'll be honest, the first time that happened, it happened twice, which is a weirdly large number of times. But the first time it happened, I was on the beach by myself and I'd been kind of staring out into the ocean and the seal comes up on the beach. And I just threw out my arms and yelled to nobody, is that an effing seal? The message I decided I was getting there is that the world is beautiful and weird and capable of all sorts of things that you never would have expected. The world is beautiful and weird and capable of all sorts of things that you never expected and you are part of the world. 
and thus also beautiful and weird and full of all kinds of things that you never expected. So one piece of our approach to the, the fear of climate change, to the dread that comes up, is to remember the joy of being a piece of this big, weird thing. You might call the next level at home. Maybe in your house, you are already doing all the at-home things you can do. You recycle, you compost, you are as energy efficient as possible. Excellent, very cool. If that is the situation in your home, uh, I am envious of you. Maybe your next step then is to look at what kind of keystone plants you can get into your yard if you've got a yard. Maybe your next step is to talk to your neighbors if you've already got stuff down, right? Maybe your neighbors don't know how to compost yet. I'll tell you what, I thought I knew a lot more about composting than I have recently realized that I do. I went to a Montessori school in the 90s. I, we learned how to compost. Um, <laughs> I've known the basics of composting since I was, I don't know, five. But I discovered a compost tumbler at my and Caitlin's new home, and as I lost my mind in joy about this bonus house item that I did not expect, I began to research. Research is my reflexive response to any large feeling. I'm very excited, I'm researching. I'm sad, I'm researching. I'm scared, I'm researching. I'm anxious, I'm researching. Just a research reflex. <laughs> And I learned that I didn't actually know the right balances of items to put in a modern home compost pile. Didn't have greens and browns and the ratios in my head because I was five when I learned how to do this and they just said, put stuff in the pile because that's how you teach a five-year-old to do that. Maybe you have a lot of leaves that fall in your yard, but your neighbor doesn't have as many. And maybe you just all compost together. Maybe where you live, they have a service where you can collect your food waste and you can just send it off to a big compost pile that can break down all kinds of stuff your home one can't. Do that if you can do it. And if you can't, Maybe you got a friend, a neighbor, someone from West who lives in your neighborhood, and you could all work together on composting. If you live near Seat Pleasant, I have a compost tumbler. I plan on using it <laughs> a lot. In your neighborhoods and in the cities where you live, you also have a little more opportunity to get stuff done politically. It is hard to change, though we have an easier time than many, it is hard to change what happens at a national level. But it is easier to change what your particular town or county does, what your HOA does if you're involved in such a situation, right? You can say, you can go to your housing association and say, it should be fine for people to change their grass to something more sustainable. The HOA shouldn't punish people for that. In fact, maybe, depending on uh, where you live and how good your HOA is to you, maybe we can even encourage people to put other stuff in their yards. Or we could have a plant sale that is focused entirely on keystone plants. Sidebar, hey Wes, maybe we could have a plant sale that focuses on keystone plants. I know a lot of you have really impressive gardens. I know this because you tell me about them. Please tell me more about your really impressive gardens, one. Two, maybe part of our plant sale is we bring in clippings of the things that we have and we share. And so some stuff is for sale, and some stuff is for have, and some stuff is for trade, and we share our knowledge. Maybe we do that out in the front yard, where everybody can see. We put up a little sign about what we're doing. Maybe 
We plant some gardens out there in the front on purpose. Maybe some with local pollinators and some with food products that we can share. Some of my favorite memories of being a child are of my grandparents' house where they had a food garden. And we would spend all kinds of time learning about what soil was good for what plants. And my grandparents were not, uh, my grandparents grew up on farms in Appalachia in the Depression. They were not big on pesticides. <laughs> They were big on here is what we have known forever works. The sharing of that kind of information. One is a generational thing that did not get as passed down as it could have. And here in a multi-general community, we have the option to share some of that knowledge across years and across locations. So maybe we do some of that. We share information and we share plants, but maybe we work in bigger coalition too. Could uh, members of the Earth Ethics Action Team raise their hands for me? I see more of you than the two people, three people who raised their hands. <laughs> so we have here at West an Earth Ethics Action Team. This is a team that you could join, yeah. We're always talking about what we can do ourselves here, what we can do practically here at WES that will make our impact not just better for the ecosystems around us, but something that other people can follow as an example. You wanna help us get a grant to add some more plants to increase our ability to slow down the runoff that comes down this hill? Come on, hang out. It'll be fun. Do you want to work with Terry in our garden? Please work with Terry in our garden. Uh, the garden is beautiful and Terry works so hard. Let's all clap for Terry. Terry did not ask for that, but my joy at that garden is so, so high, I could not do without clapping. But we could also join more coalition, right? The more of us are working together, the more we are connecting around our shared care for the planet we all live on, the more impact we get to have. The Washington Interfaith Network has an environmental justice track of the work that they do. And they do legislative activism in DC, so helping the DC city government see where they need to improve their policies for the health of our environment. They also go with readers into public housing in DC, because much of public housing in DC has gas, heat, gas stoves, and they are poorly maintained, and natural gas is heavy in those homes. That's bad for the environment broadly, but also very specifically for the people who live in those homes. That sort of coalition work lets us get to know people who are being affected by environmental racism, by environmental classism, right here, right now. It lets us get to know people who have a pretty high stake in the environmental policies because the people on the margins, the poorer people, people of color, are always hurt worst and first. When we work in that kind of coalition, we're gonna find other coalitions that make sense for us to be part of. I know that Reverend Nancy McDonald Ladd at uh, Cedar Lane, is that where she is? River Road, there are so many UU congregations I can't keep them straight. At River Road is working on a gathering of UUs who are concerned about environmental justice. And let me tell you, you do not have to identify as a UU to go to that. So I'm gonna send out some information about that and I would love for us to show up, to participate, 
maybe we can talk to the folks at the Northern Virginia Ethical Society or in Baltimore and say, hey, we're going to go to this UU thing. Why don't you come with us? Or, hey, here's what we're working on. What can we do to help you and what can you do to help us? How can we share knowledge and work together to make our impact even greater? I think this is a place where Wes has a real opportunity to lead, to say that our commitment to relationship is so great our realization that we are part of everything is so fundamental to how we move, that we are going to change our own landscape and we're gonna encourage you to do the same where you can. That we're going to step out of our comfort zones. We're gonna go get to know some new people, connect across the lines of language around faith, which can be complicated to do. But we're going to take this step, and we're going to say, we are here, and we are here to help, and we are here to learn and grow together. We can't afford to not do anything. We can't afford to be complacent. We can't afford to decide that we have done enough. We also can't afford to get lost in this as a situation of personal piety, right? We can't afford to get focused on, well, I do everything right. Okay. <laughs> cool, please do everything as well as you can. But let's not let this idea of perfect, of what a perfect environmentalist would do, get in the way of getting the things done that we can get done. Let's not let fear of climate change, of breaking out of our bubbles, of anything. Keep us from doing what needs to be done. Greta Thunberg is right, we gotta panic a little bit. But most of us can't live in panic and work from there exclusively. Please do not try. I think all of us have had enough time in life to have done that at least once and found out that it doesn't work so well. Or if it works for you, please do. Uh, it does not work for me. But if we can say, okay, this, this scares me, but I'm looking at it anyway. This scares me, but I'm talking about it anyway. This scares me, but I am showing up anyway. Well, then things will start to get done. And it'll take time, and it'll take work, and it is not going to be easy because oh, nothing is, and also it turns out there's just billions and billions of dollars pushing the other direction. However, when one person reaches another person and they connect for real, that builds something stronger than dollars are, and that you don't actually need billions of. But hey, also, more people are affected by climate change than are most causing it, right? We all have a role, but unless you are personally taking a lot of private jets, in which case I need to have a conversation with you about your pledge. Unless you are personally taking a lot of private jets or, I don't know, own an oil refinery, again, in which case I need to talk to you about your pledge and the ethical spending of that money. Anyway, um, unless that's you, then your individual actions aren't the biggest piece. I still encourage you to do whatever you can, but remember that relationship building is where we have power. Our biggest power is our ability to connect with other people and together say no. Together say, my government needs to step in together say, you can't do that here, wherever we have the power to say here, but also you shouldn't do that anywhere. We have power in connection and in speaking. We have the ability to do what we can to be examples. So let's go. I'm gonna talk more about this going forward. 
it happens that I have discovered that this is more of a passion than I had realized. So let's go. Let's get some grants, let's plant some stuff here, let's make some friends. Let's see what we can get done for all of us. Thank you. You iPad show. Okay. Sorry. I did have this set up this thing too. There we are. Thank you, Casey. That was delightful. In a few moments, we will have our community sharing time when you can write into the chat or share in person about what resonated with you in this platform. While we listen to today's musical response, you might prepare by reflecting on a personal experience or an activity at West that the platform brings to mind. Please distill your thoughts to a single idea that you can share in one to two minutes. Love Led Zeppelin. I love that version of that song. It's really good. This is the time when we add our voices to the morning, sharing our reflections on the platform or what resonates with our personal experience. For our online participants, I invite you to share in the Zoom chat or in the comments if you are watching the recording later. If you are here in person, we're going to continue with our experiment with the conversation corner. Up front here for folks who'd like to share thoughts and feelings with each other in a little bit more depth. I see a show of hands of those who might like to be a part of that conversation. Okay, well, perhaps people will have more thoughts they want to share after hearing the response period. Now, for those who would like to offer a brief one to two minute response, I will bring the microphone to folks who raise their hands. We'll have just about 10 minutes, so please keep your response brief so others have a chance to share. And if you've spoken in recent weeks, please hold back to leave space for others. Please raise your hand, and when I bring you the mic, please turn and face the back of the hall so online participants can see who is speaking. Begin by saying your name and offering your pronouns, and then share your single idea. Hello, John Pfeiffer, he, him. Uh, to go back to a very early part of the platform, if anybody would like to quiz themselves or practice at home for reading the statement of purpose, uh, it's available on the website in the About Us section. <laughs> Come over here. Hi, I'm Terry, he, him. Uh, Kermit the Frog said, it ain't easy being green, or maybe he said it's hard being green, but it, it can be fun to get your hands dirty in the dirt, and we want to give that opportunity to the children to help us plant some wildflowers this morning. We have um, some down in the, uh, in the stairwell, and we're going to plant them in the area in the vegetable in the uh, insect garden that is uh, spaded and we'll do that right after the platform so if your children could join us it would be a lot of fun I'm Lindsay and you know I'm visiting from Boston it's always wonderful to be here and I always have something to say <laughs> uh, my pronouns are she um, I have gotten involved in an activist, some climate activist groups in Boston, in the, actually in uh, Somerville. And it feels so good to feel like you're contributing to the solution. And I've learned huge amounts about it. It's an incredibly technical field with the, the labor shortages for some of the skills that are needed for various aspects of the transition. The engineering challenges of tapering down on a um, methane gas, you know, natural gas is 95% methane. You know, there are just lots and lots of technical challenges which I've loved learning about. 
but there are a lot of people working on them at a very high level, and it just feels great to be part of that. Hi, I'm Sue, she, her. Um, first, I want to thank Casey for a very powerful platform, very meaningful platform. Um, I've been involved in several environmental groups for years, but I'm also very aware of there are several more things I really, really need to do. I need to be more active. I need to get out of the ridiculous house where my husband and I raised kids. That needs to be for a family. I need to move somewhere little and environmentally efficient because as my son keeps saying, single people in big houses, baby boomers in big houses, are one of the reasons they keep building more and more housing farther and farther out. And then we need to move somewhere small so people who need the space can have the houses. Hi, I'm Ann, she, her, and um, also a member of Earth Ethics Committee with Terry, and I want to give a huge shout out to him for all the work he's done on our insect garden, which... <laughs> <laughs> which which um, everybody can help with. We really do want to expand it on more of the property. And also, I want to let you know that um, we have some information. I have some little booklets that I can sell to you for a very small price on native plant choices today. And um, also, we would love to have some more young people on the Earth Ethics team. Young ideas, it would be great. Hi, I'm Joe, she, her. It's funny, um, I've been noticing that um, I don't see any worms on the sidewalk that I have to avoid stepping on, and I haven't heard anything about them. And I, years ago, maybe decades ago, as a birthday present, I, I gave my brother a bin and a pound of red earthworms. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, he kept it for many years, and I, I just wrote him yesterday and asked him. I said, I, I don't think you're using that anymore. Do you still have it? And um, he said he has the bin, but he doesn't have the worms. Because <laughs> he is a gardener, and the earthworms make topsoil <laughs> out of your uh, kitchen scraps. So I think I'm going to buy him another pound of <laughs> red earthworms. Thank you to everyone who shared. Let's see if there are any comments back on Zoom. I know there are. I saw them coming in early. So first, recognize someone who was miss earlier. Uh, Martina and Ruth are online and wanted to say hello to everybody. Uh, Island sent you many thumbs up and hearts as you were speaking. Uh, Peter says, thank you, Casey, for a perspective that we have not been reminded about enough. Island again says, thank you. Judy says, Casey, wonderful as ever, I love that you are talking about how we can model acting despite fear, model recognizing the critical nature of and then building something, building relationships, model doing something and not letting perfection be the enemy of the good. Thank you for concrete, doable steps. Of course, the proceeds of plant sale would go to Wes's operating budget and doing it front, out front allows the public to come and participate and learn more about Wes. Get all kinds of benefits from having a good plant sale. Thank you to all who shared their thoughts and attention. Just as we share our perspectives in this community, so too do we share our resources and gifts. Here at West, we split all undesignated gifts in the Sunday collection between our operating budget and a fund dedicated to justice and compassion. In keeping with our social justice theme of bodily autonomy, 
Our Share the Plate recipient for April will be Wes's Our Whole Lives program, or OWL. For the coming SEEK year, we want to run elementary, middle, and high school courses with four teachers in each cohort. Teachers must undergo training and be certified, and that costs about $250 a person. So let's all take a moment to prepare to respond to the invitation to generosity as we are able. To donate online through the Breeze system, go to tiny.cc forward slash westgives, or click on give on our website, ethicalsociety.org. To donate in person today, place cash or check in the basket at the back of the hall on your way out, and you can always send a check by mail. Thank you for your generosity. We will now receive your gifts and the gift of music. Thank you so much to the many people who helped to create this morning's time together, today's platform speaker, KC, and Laura DeShulo for curating today's music videos. Staff members in Dara Miles, Robin Kravitz, and Maceo Thomas, and of course, our platform production volunteers, the tech team members, slide artists, Zoom chat usher, and in-person greeters. I want to mention a few things upcoming in the life of our community. Heartfelt thanks to everyone who, for making our West Sunday Cafe such a success. Particular thanks to all the folks doing an awesome job of helping with cleaning up. Since we are all living here, we can all contribute by wiping off the table and keeping it tidy. And cleanup instructions can also be found on the clipboard and at tiny.cc forward slash West Coffee sign up. The merry band of caffeinators and our wonderful West staff, thank you. Next Sunday is Spring Festival. So Casey, I wrote a note that says, bring flowers, dot, dot, dot. I, I didn't know if there was anything else there. Bring flowers. Might be a friend too. Bring flowers, bring a friend. It'll be a nice production. It'll be a good time. And food. Potluck. That, see, that's the thing that was missing. I knew there was something missing. It's a potluck, bring food. Um, I can promise you that we're going to bring bread or cookies or cakes or something. It's going to be baked. That's what we do at our house. We bake things. After a rousing, successful first time ever pledge brunch, we need a rousing response of your pledge commitment to Wes. If you haven't already sent in your pledge, please do so by the end of the month, that's this month, to allow enough time for the board and staff to craft a budget for our next fiscal year. And thank you to all of you who have already stepped up and increased their pledges. It means a lot to all of us. Today in the Social Hall, the CRC and Lifelong Learning are co-hosting the next in the Creating a Caring Culture series called Fear of Conflict. In this workshop, participants will confront harmful power systems that show up in ourselves, our community, and society in general, and aim to disconnect people. We'll explore how we can change our thinking and behavior to form more cooperative and collaborative ways to engage with each other. Lastly, join the, hmm, wait, that's the same one. It's okay, we're good. The final installation is going to be, installation, the final installment, that's the right word, is going to be next Sunday, um, actually next Monday, on April 29th via Zoom for the final session of Through the Stages of Life, Planning for the Future series. Uh, we will discuss all options for caring for someone's body after their death and honoring their memory. You can sign up via the link in the West calendar to receive the Zoom link to join. That's it for announcements today. As always, you can find information about opportunities to connect in the weekly news and notes email and on the calendar page of Wes's website, ethicalsociety.org. Again, if you are new to our community, please introduce yourself in person or via the connection form at tiny.cc forward slash Wes Connects or an email to Wes at ethicalsociety.org. At the conclusion of the platform, please join us for social hour, either here or on Zoom at tiny.cc forward slash West Coffee Hour. I invite you now to join in our closing music and closing words. I'm going to walk it with you up on the screen. And now for our closing words. Let us go into the week ahead with compassion, understanding, and commitment to nurture our communities and defend each person's self-determination. Thank you all for joining today's platform in person or remotely. We look forward to connecting with you again soon.